Hi guys, welcome back to another episode of The Big Shift, where we deliver the most raw, riveting content. Today we're going to go to the UK, guys, and we're going to talk about the UK's top mobsters, top gangsters, top villains. I've got someone here today, he's a big name. You know, he spent over 40 years in organised crime, went to many of the UK's most maximum security prisons and seen unbelievable things there, guys. He was a hit man himself in many staff he was even killed himself this is a an unbelievable story of a man also who traveled through this darkness but also turned his life around coming next hi guys and welcome to tuning in today got a wonderful story today for you with yami b one of the uk's most Notorious villains, certainly. We are now, my media company has signed a worldwide TV deal now. So our content is going to be global, guys. We're talking a, a two billion audience. We're going to be on places like Apple, Sony, Netflix, Amazon. All this coming soon just for you. A lot of exciting things coming up. I'll keep you posted with that, guys. Now, today, my special guest, a friend of mine from back in the day, it has to be said, is... Yami B. Yami, how are you doing? Really nice to be here with you again, Steve. Uh, it's going well at the moment. I'm in Scotland doing the rounds, of course, still travelling. Uh, very much homeless still, but not that homeless, if you get what I mean, Steve. But um, yeah, just love to be here, Steve. Yeah. Yami, look, I've got to say, you know, I take my hat off to you. You're going through transitions in your life. But I remember you from back in the day, you know, and all of that stuff. You're the the real thing, you know, a proper guy. Now, today, I want to get straight into the proper content. You know, we've got a big US audience, you know, some wonderful people out there. And I want to talk about the top UK mobsters and gangsters. You know, I know you know a lot of them. Just explain uh, a little bit about your criminal journey, Amy, and how long you've done in prison up to now. Uh, I think the best way to describe it, uh, Steve, is, of course, you know, the beginning where I stabbed um, an abuser. And then I was institutionalised from 12 years old. No, started off following, uh, being part of uh, low-level crime. And then, you know, into prison, secure units, uh, HMP, um, YPs, and all the way up. And then I started to change. And then obviously it got round to robberies, uh, firearms, jumping over things, uh, really a madman in the middle of the night, drug addiction. Um, basically, uh, all at sea. Uh, with everything, Steve. And the only way I knew how to deal with things was come straight out of prison and go straight on crime sprees. Now we know better. But, um, yep, Steve, it's a bit like that, really. But my crimes escalated from being just the low-level criminal in that life, if you get what I mean, to being in the Bs and the Acats, to learning more and more and more about how really dirty the game can get, Steve. So it was more that. And then I learned off those, then my behaviour immolated those and then we reached the stage where I'm at today, Steve. The game is very dirty. Now, I know that certainly, you know, you was a hitman in prison. Is that correct? Yeah, I was, Steve. But I, I like to say a bit more of a comedian, though, to be honest, boy. But yeah, no, there were a couple I did that were a bit out of order. And I've got regrets over those things. But, you know, at the time, survival and what we want, frightened of being killed yourself, frightened to not make the first move so we get hurt first. In that life, Steve, when the years go by, you learn to react on the moment, whether right or wrong, you know, because we've seen it with our own eyes. People die and are injured very fatally and, and severely every day in there. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, and look, this is the thing, see, so, you know, you, I always say you can't have the light without the darkness or nope. in many respects, the darkness without the light. So now yes. we're going to go straight into the darkness first. We can, you know, we're going to go into the light after. But look, yeah. you know, another question was, you was nearly killed yourself, wasn't you? What happened with that? Tell us about that. When you were stabbed and you was... You, oh, I yeah, in the end. On you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In the early days, Steve, uh, not so it, find it a bit funny now. Uh, but in those early 90s, the middle 90s, when I was really on the on the warpath and unsettled and with no love outside as well, not in contact with the outside world, Steve. So I basically gave up hope, uh, reinvented myself as uh, somebody uh, that was tough and hard and wanted to be like the baddest out of everyone, really. So 
you know, for the wrong reasons, Steve. But I remember in Swellside when they rushed me, I picked up a few stamps there that day where I was bobbing and weaving. And then we had, of course, Preston, where I rubbed somebody on the wing in there and the whole yard rushed me, Steve. That was in the 90s. And then after that, we stopped using fists and things like that. And then I started to use weapons. And that's when things escalated even more with my time in there, Steve. Because you was nearly killed one time. I mean, you know, and you, you know, you still have some little slight problems today, although you're okay, you know. What happened with that, Yemen? Yeah, that was a different scenario, Steve, because for all the wars, without, throughout the 30, 40 years, and being on this side and that side, uh, I was expecting to really get paralyzed by three, four, and five spinal. So I was paralyzed for a few months without, you know, being hoisted out on the bed and never to walk or use your hands again because it's so high up and the fractures are on each of the things. You've only got seven uh, um, things in the in your back that connect to the brain. And obviously, if it can't go through the neck, can't reach the hands and the thing. So they're talking the miracle of Christopher Reeve injuries and Superman. And he had the same injuries as me, but he did get up, rest in peace. But really... Uh, I'm lucky to be alive, Steve. Um, um, at the worst, is I'm meant to be in a wheelchair, and they're still saying that I might be. So, you know, there's, there's still complications, Steve. I mean, you know, I'm walking around uh, to a certain thing, but there's a name that they're calling me, the Invisible Walker. So that yeah. means the, in the injuries are, are there, but only I know about them. Do you see what I mean? No, I get that. Look, you know, we wish you well on that, and I know, I know, I know about some of these things. And so, look, what was the, what was the, most dangerous situation that you think that you was in or you see in prison? The most dangerous, Steve, uh, the most shocking in one go, because I haven't seen too many killed in my life with eyes on the, on the thing. So I have to always step back to Wayland when somebody got stabbed over a jar, over a bit of yeast. He's coming back from the kitchen. He's giving it to the wrong person who's supposed to deliver. There's arguments between the thing. And then also somebody turns out. And he had nothing to do with the deal. He was just doing someone a favor, apparently. And then I watched uh, with a few others on the landing where a man drew out a knife, one stab, and it was all over, Steve. And then, of course, we've got the hot, fat things of, of real serious nature along the years, two or three times. And, Allegedly once, uh, me as well, Steve, no real regrets over that as well for my part in whatever. Do you see what I mean? But to see people peel with their skin from face and, you know, and to go in the hospital wing for months and months and taped up with um, things, that's a very, 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 very serious act of, like, hatred. It's the worst thing that can happen with the oil, hot oil and fat. But again, the level of violence, Steve, there's countless countless of times when I see blood squirting, where I see one man get rushed by a hundred and he's lying dead, dead enough on the floor, but still alive, you know, from all kinds of things, Steve, from weights being hit on somebody's head, you know, from going in the shower and doing someone there, you know, all, all sets, all things along the years, Steve, like you've seen, there are serious violent uh, places for all things in prison over the smallest things. Absolutely. And these things are magnified and it's crazy how they can erupt, just like that. And um, what would you say was the most dangerous prison you was in, Yemi? My most dangerous, Steve. Uh, at that time, being the man that I was, obviously, I look at Long Larton as depending on who's there at the time. But when all the lot are there together at the same time, my view was always the same, Steve. It's always who's in the jail at the same time. Because certain times we went round, me and you, and then we went places, it was all really quiet. And there weren't much trouble for months on end. And then a character comes from there, character comes from there, we build it all around, and then three more drop in, shipped out from over there. Then the mix-up starts again because he's got trouble with him from five years ago. He's got trouble with him and whose side who's going to be on. And then so you've got to sit on the fence sometimes, and then it feels like you're just in the gladiator arena, just waiting for fights to kick off, Steve. Uh, like a bunch of animals waiting to see blood and guts everywhere, you know? Uh... Yeah, I mean, you know, I want you to, there's a few prisons, right? You know, Armley, Winston Green, Armley, Steve, Armley, Winston Green, strange ways, but I'm talking, those are more like the blocks. So the locals in the old days, certain of them, uh, from Walton to Armley to Winston Green, all the way up. You know, they were serious places as well, especially if you're out of your district. You see what I mean? Even Durham, Steve. Durham, what a shit old man. Look, you know, I mean, they have, you know, they have 
it's a strategy for these guys. How they'd move some rank cat uh, cat A's, but they'd have certain places marked where they'd be waiting for us. And certainly, I remember right some of them you just mentioned, and I'm talking about the dispersals. So these are the uh, penitentiary um, kind of places over there, supermax that we would relate to here, you know, in the UK. So you're talking about uh, category A, category A, maximum security. This is a different level. I mean, violence is the same anywhere, but there's a different level of kind of violence in these places because of the, the security of all the prisoners in there. And there was only certain places that we could go, and you can go as a cat. Hey? So you go around this merry-go-round that was prisoned within prisons, and this is where there'd be a lot of the tit-for-tat gang stuff, you know? Tell us about some of the gang stuff that you witnessed, Jamie, and how that went. Um, you know, funny enough, I just done a video this morning on uh, the Jamaican countrymen, and you know when they came into the, the category A's and B's, and you know the, the first ever gangs that I saw, kind of thing, uh, in the nineties in jail for that kind of thing. Jamaican had the first kind of crowd, but now everywhere you go, a different country: Polish, Albanian, Moroccan, Somalian. We've got all the gangs now. Birmingham, London, everything is completely different because why? In our day, Stevie Gillen, there weren't no gangs and there weren't no, no, no gangs to be able to rush one man for anything uh, silly because all the main people would get involved. You know, the wings have changed now. The wings have changed now where we're not having the one and two of the old villains controlling the wings. Now we're having eight, 10, 15 wannabes who want to be number one. And the clash starts there, and the staff have lost control. But the gang thing is really, really serious now. And not that I was ever thinking about going back there, Steve, but I much prefer the older days. There was a level of respect to everything. From what I saw in recent times, the whole of the, the sea cats and bees, most of them, were out of control. And nobody seemed to care. They just wait for the violence to happen, sometimes instigating themselves, Steve. You know, you're not allowed on that wing or you know you're coming from a jail. It's written in the file. He's not allowed to be with him. What do they do? Because he pissed them off, put them with the other lot so that you have to turn up there and get done again. There's a lot of struggles that go on with him <laughs> that a lot of people don't know how the A's especially and the skullduggery and the snakiness, not just from the inmates, Steve, but from the staff as well. They're always in the melting pot. But, Steve, the violence now is off the Richter because they're running up on you 10, 15 handed and you're all alone walking down the yard. You're scared to go out in the morning without your tool because you're wondering if a bunch of kids are going to come sprinting down the road like a pack of wolves and they're going to jump on you and stab you to death, you know? Yeah, no. I, so for the viewers, explain how the hierarchy kind of was, say, back in the old days in, say, a flagship place like Parkhurst Prison, Notorious Prison, on the Isle of Wight, yeah. back in the day when, right, what, what? Explain what the structures were like and the hierarchy then. In the hierarchy, Parkus was the one place, uh, not Albany and the rest of the cats. Parkus was the place where a lot of London men and other counties and cities wanted to go first because it had the stigma, the reputation, that this is where all the real gangsters are with all the money and we've got everything down there. So hurry up and get down there. So then when you get down there, everything's free and easy. You're getting drinks everywhere off everybody. The screws are happy that a couple are on the wing and they've got control and they can watch through that rather than the violence. But the difference is, one of the differences, Steve, is that those days in Parkers, they let the cons run the wing a little bit. And say control and break up fights. Don't let nobody get hurt. There was always a main party, whether it's laziness on their part, or they're just waiting to pick up the bits and bobs. And if somebody comes in to upset the apple cart, it upsets the full wing thing. And we've met those nutters along the years where they just turn up and they're not big names and they come in there. And they go, ooh, what? And everybody's saying, who's that? He's got to go, isn't he? You know, that kind of stuff. So in the old days, Steve, if you're wrong, nonce, sexual offender, all that kind of stuff, you would get weighed in straight away. Now, no rules. There's no uh, distinguishing between crimes. They don't care, the kids. All they care about is the beef with each other and what are they going to do next to keep their self uh, safe. That's a 
that's a good explanation, Yami, of then and now, right? You know, going back in the day, some of the real notorious names. Now, I have to say as well, you know, like I know in my life, there's a difference, there's different levels of organized criminals or gangsters to mobsters, right? Or proper names who do different. Tell us about some of the names back in the day, some of the top guys who you knew, some stories about them, yeah. Well, I looked up to, um, you know, Steve, I looked up to the older lot. You know me, uh, the older villains, about 10 years older than me and you, maybe a bit older, around about the same age, but probably came of age as a bigger hierarchy criminal quicker than me. You know, the levels they got taught better earlier uh, and the set of rules to be a proper gangster and the moral code of what it all means and everything, which I don't apply to much more anymore, Steve, to be honest, you know, to be said. But the greatest, the greatest, the greatest names, you know, you're talking Mickey McAvoy, you're talking Billy Tobin, you're talking Stevie Gillen, you're talking Razor, you're talking um, who was Kenny Noy. I like Kenny. Kenny's good stuff. Uh, you're talking Terry Adams. You're talking, you know, major, major, the big names out there, allegedly. You know, all I could do is go and buy what I saw from them. And whether, you know, I believe the stories about them or not, it's not on the agenda, Steve. It's how I got on with them as a person. And my favourite ones who I got on with are very down to earth, very humble, no talking, you know, keeping it really simple. The proper lot, Steve. There's many. There's Johnny Kendall. There's Gary Staggs. There's, um, what's his name again? Gary Tyson. You know, all, 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 all there's names that we could go on forever. But from back in the day, Dave Croak even. We did like Dave, you know, as an older man. Had plenty of bottle, rest in peace, my boy. Desi Cunningham, rest in peace as well. Do you see what I mean? Um, what's his name again? I can't Steve, man. There's just too many in my head. Martin Valentine, you know, as well uh, from the old days. But everybody that we could probably think of that me and you met that were involved in the big crimes, allegedly, the ones that were sophisticated, got in, done properly, not so many hurt, not unnecessary violence, even though some of them might have had the violence in there. You know, the real uh, moral code is to try and get the money with limited violence and things. That's different from today as well. So we know in the old days, we, you know, women, children wouldn't get here. It wasn't, it was really unheard of that you could come and be doing stuff like this and you wouldn't be getting much happening to you whilst you're in prison. Because you and I both know there was no respect for that kind of stuff back in the day, Steve. You see what I mean? You make a really good point. Thanks for that. Of course, all them names, there are so many, right? You know, when you think of names like that, for me, I think about the quality of the person. Yeah. It shines through. And it's always going to shine through, you know? And this is the thing, and that's in about not just codes of conduct, but everything they do is a reflection of the of the quality of them right so but you know you make an interesting point i mean i talked to a lot of uh ex-mob guys across the pond you know they're riveting stories and you know it's very fascinating how the world of organized crime it translates to the same stuff right yeah. pretty much there are just different degrees of it yeah i mean we know that but the bit i'm talking about is how it's changed how like anything else in the, the old era going on into the modern era, we're seeing yeah. a lot of different stuff. This is interesting. So, you know, we're kind of seeing that, you know, you're saying about the codes of conduct. So do you think these things are uh, lost now in the UK? How would you say how it is now? I'm very, very uh, frightened, Stephen, uh, to be honest with you. I can't see no solution or end to the problem of being out of control in jail. Because what I witnessed the last few years after I left you is running wild beyond belief. And the staff now, in the old days, you'd have one or two officers, wouldn't you? I'd bring stuff in. Now you've got 10, 20, everybody's at it because they're applying for the job and getting it easy and doing six weeks training. And they're in, do you see what I mean? So they can be easily got at, Steve. But again, it causes unrest violence, mix-ups, all of it. So I can't see beyond me that if it's got worse and worse with the stabbings and gang culture and you're turning a blind eye and not enough staff, you're doing all that, then how is it to get better? Because you, how are you going to change it? You can't change it, Steve. You're going to have to employ more staff, get the wings more secure, stop people coming up. But you have to come out for labour. You have to see people. It's going to be the same thing. And these kids, they don't mind uh, running up on you with a knife and their staff present. 
They're not mine, Steve. They don't care. They've got no care for it at all. And when they're down the block, <clears> you know? It has to be said, look, you know, you may have seen it. There was a big article, you know, about me doing stuff. They was talking about, about this issue in the star. Just gone, the knife crime and it's yeah, and yeah. different stuff, right? Yep. About this issue, right? And um, back in the day with the screws, for instance, right? What did you see with some of these guys who was bringing stuff in? You know, I mean, you know, and how damaging that was, how damaging that was, and what kind of violence that caused? You see, because the old days, Steve, right? Uh, I hope I'm not putting my finger on too much here, but in the old days, when you went to the London jails for allocation, there was even a man you could pay to get to Parkhurst or get a DCAT. If you could qualify for it, there'd be ways of doing it. So there's always been bent staff. Just depends to what level. My view is in the 80s up until the early 90s, bit of puff, bit of burn, bit of this, bit of that. No hard drugs really around in the old days. Maybe bits and bobs in the 90s, but in the 80s, there weren't a lot of class a you wouldn't see a lot of it but the screws now compared to then bring in screwdrivers knives all that kind of stuff steve anything that can cause the unrest it doesn't matter what you're bringing in you're not wearing a badge uh, with honor the queen's badge for one so they're in a fine position to talk all right they could cuss me because i was an ex-criminal but at the end of the day nothing can work unless you've got the right people doing the job steve uh, and if people, if he goes over there, like these, some of these young officers now, they go over there and they tell an inmate that he said, what, well, I'll be careful with that. You're causing unrest. They used to do it with us back in the day, little, small little things. Like it wouldn't happen as much. But like, you need to go on there now, Steve. Them sea cats and locals are in real, real trouble. Yeah. I mean, I can remember, look, you know, I, it's about you, this interview. So uh, tell us about a time where you were set up by the officers in there or put with enemies or all yeah. that kind of stuff. We used to get a lot of this, right, back in the days, right? So, right, you know, I remember very clearly. But tell us some of, some of the instances where you were set up, Yami, in there and it was do or die. You know, there's a good chance you're going to get death there even or very, very seriously hurt, right? Well, there, were, there was also that time in High Down, Steve, where I was on the warpath. Right. And I was running up and down, doing what I used to do in there, really act like I'm outside and try and get everything I wanted because I knew that I wasn't getting out anytime too soon, Steve. And, you know, my behavior, it escalated with fighting and robbing, you know, in certain places in the jail where I used to go one up on my own and, you know, take the liberty of uh, robbing and things like that, Steve. But then the time came where I had to face the music and the staff. I remember I didn't want to go on the exercise that morning in high down. If I I remember rightly, Steve. But I got out, but I came out, but all the other wings were out, so I could see enemies all over. So I run back in to get a weapon and run back out. But when I got to the gate, he said to me, what did you run in for? I said, oh, I was, I was cold or something. Like I put on a cardigan or an extra jumper just in case, Steve. You know, when you've got a strap up, just in case you've got to get stabbed and you want some books underneath there and that kind of stuff. And he says, oh, I'm, I'm letting you back out. But I thought he was going to say no to me but he was an officer that I never got on with as well, Steve, because I was a string vest, a pest back in the day. And I went on the yard and I pulled out two tools and I went round. I stabbed about three or four people, uh, not severely, but I got back in off the yard as well, Steve, and I got back indoors and then they started on me and come to the door and I had a fisticuff, probably my greatest ever performance fighting with the screws, albeit one minute and 20 seconds, Steve. Uh, but, yeah, that's the kind of things that can escalate uh, with things when they're going back and forth and putting you in situations, middling you up. You know what I'm saying, Steve? It's very, I've gone to the extreme cases. Even the, day, the time I got stabbed in swell cell, I could see the holes in me. But I was still trying to fight, Steve. You know how it is already, boy. Yeah, so, look, I just want to go back outside and kind of get the, you know, the viewers to understand, for those who may not know, how this... This culture, these 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 beefs, how this this crime and this violence translates from outside to inside. Tell us about some of the things outside, some of the really dark things that I know you would have seen that outside that you know they translate yeah. inside, right? Tell us about yeah. some of them, yeah. So like, all right. So recent times, so gang culture. Recent times, east, north, west, south, London, 
or whatever, all age groups, all eras, I've been with them all from 40 years ago up until this time. So I've got enough time to study how it works with the youngsters as well, Steve, greatly so. And they, all their beefs come from outside and postcodes. Right, Steve? So you don't have to know the person you're going to meet in jail and you're going to stab him and harm him severely. You just hear that he's part of somebody else. Many mistakes are made that way. But in the old days, Steve, the old beefs are more, you know, they're much more serious as in when you do harm somebody outside or you've taken a right liberty, you know, in the old days, when you get to prison, uh, the violence is the more clinical, serious, but not too many of them. Do you see what I mean? But now, with the gang culture at its heights, Steve, it's a no-go area uh, for most jails. Thanks for tuning in, guys, to a wonderful new segment of The Big Shift with Stephen Gillen. Make sure to subscribe, like, go into stephengillen.com and sign up for more wonderful content to expedite, help and support you on your own personal journey of success.